Today is Welcome Everybody Monday, June 27th, 2022. Uh, next Monday is July 4th, so we will not be here. The markets will be closed. Uh, so have a great three-day weekend, everybody, uh, next week. Um, but we will be here uh, every day this week. And I wanted to start off by uh, noticing that we do have a new producer right now, Jonathan Hicks. Logan Johnson, our normal producer, is out for the week. He just got married last weekend. So congratulations to him. Congratulations, Logan. We miss you. So if you're listening, uh, congratulations, Logan. Seems unlikely. <laughs> Let's begin. All right. Um, today, we actually just started off with durable goods orders from May, and this might actually help the case for those who think that we might not be in a recession. We were up seven tenths of a percent in the month of May. Consensus was up two tenths of a percent. That is a big ingredient into uh, the GDP report. So if we start to get more durable goods orders coming in, then that's going to potentially mean that we do, can avoid a recession. But um, again, I, I think that that's certainly an anomaly in terms of the data that should be good for markets, though, I would, I would imagine. Um, we're going to talk today a lot of big picture stuff. We're going to talk about inflation. We're going to talk about whether or not we think the bottom is in in the markets, as well as looking ahead to next week. But we want to start off by talking about the G7 meeting that's currently ongoing. Uh, President Vladimir Zelensky was invited to speak at the G7 uh, meeting. He said that he wants the war over by the end of the year uh, in, in comments to individuals there. Um, he also requested more support for flight defense system security and financing for reconstruction. And the U.S. will prepare. The biggest news is that the U.S. will provide an air defense system, including medium and long range surface to air missile defense systems. Um, so that's the big story on the Ukraine front. Uh, the G7 is exploring ways to get a cap on the price of Russian oil. I don't know how they'll go about doing that. I think that's going to be difficult to get through in practice. Um, I think the bottom line here, and I'm be interested to hear what your thoughts are, Tom, is that the West is trying to put the squeeze on Russia while they still can, because they know that you flip this into the winter time, and patience is going to run very thin supplying more weapons to Ukraine, but especially dealing with the fallout from the sanctions and the fact that a lot of Europeans will be freezing in the wintertime because they can't access Russian gas. Yeah, I think it's just uh, at this point, it's either now or never. I think uh, we've already seen the uh, ruble rally. We've seen that Russia's actually done very well. You know, they're selling all their oil to India and China. And that sucked up a lot of that demand. And I think that you know, unless unless we can really find a meaningful way to hurt them on the oil front, this you know this is just a, a, a exercise in spinning our wheels. And so you know they want to shut the door. They want to shut the door now. Uh, you know, so that we can be done and and lines can be open for the winter. But I mean, I just don't see it happening. I don't know. I don't. I don't know the mechanism for which that actually occurs. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Tom. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, I think that there needs to be a cohesive agreement today really with the g7 and i'm not sure we're going to get that either yeah um moving closer to home on the inflation front uh it's great to have tom back uh tom was uh with us last week although it's not here in the office uh, on the positive side we do have oil prices that have backed off uh we do have the u.s dollar has strengthened which means our imports cost less in u.s dollar terms um and on core inflation the cleveland fed right now is tracking at up 5.7% in June, which is still very high, but it's down from the 6% we just printed in May. So potential uh, improvement there on inflation. However, that is offset by used vehicle prices that remain stubbornly high. Uh, you have used vehicles that are still up 11% on a year-over-year -year basis. That's up from 10% in May. You have median home price that's still up 14% on a year-over-year -year basis, well above the 5.5% that's assumed in the CPI calculation, which I continue to think is the biggest mismatch and could result in higher for longer inflation. And then the Cleveland Fed is actually tracking, although it's tracking lower on core inflation, it's tracking higher on reported inflation. They're tracking 8.7% headline in June. That's up from 8.6% in May. So you have positives and negatives on the inflation front. Uh, in evidence last week was the decline in oil and the decline in metals. Um, but you still have some of these prices that remain high. Tom, what are your thoughts with the bond market 
telling us on this front? I mean, we're seeing expectations drop significantly. I mean, we really reached, reached peak, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we saw the two-year treasury go all the way up to a 343. I mean, it was the, the worst day for the two-year treasury since the Lehman Brothers collapse, uh, which is really saying something because we've been sitting at basically zero on the two-year for the period since then. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's a little bit of a head fake. I think that we're seeing rates come down. People are saying, hey, inflation is not going to be up forever. In fact, it's not only is it going to come down, but it's going to crater, uh, you know, sometime in the foreseeable future. You know, that's certainly possible, but I just, you know, the number of rate hike expectations has not come down. Uh, that affects the two-year treasury probably the most. I mean, two-year treasuries dropped down about like a 308 or so. Uh, let's see, a 30, 310 as of this morning. Uh, and so I just don't see a scenario where inflation is going to fall exceptionally quickly. I mean, sure, oil prices have fallen, but they've fallen from the highs, which was what, two weeks ago. So of the whole quarter, we've had relief for the last couple of days. Is that enough to move the needle for the print? I don't think so, but you know, that remains to be, to be seen outside of that. I don't really know what else to look to where we would potentially see uh, rapidly de rapid deceleration in inflation. And so from my perspective, I think this is uh, a great time to be looking to rebalance your portfolio, selling some of these bonds and buying some equities because the prices have popped quite a bit in the last week or so. But we've seen this, we saw this in May, right? We saw an unbelievable bond rally, particularly munis in May. And then the May inflation print hit and all that got washed out to sea and then some. And so, you know, that's how I'm trying to navigate this right now on the bond side is look for opportunities, particularly when clients are a little out of whack because their asset allocation has gotten skewed because bonds have not gone down as much as equities use that opportunity for, you know, rebalancing coming out of some of the stuff that maybe we don't want to hold on to for the long term uh, or can be opportunistic with on price uh, and use that to get everybody back in line. And so that's what I've, I've been doing and how I'm reacting to the move in the, in the bond market this week. I think it's noticeable and it's important to take note because I think we're taught, we talk a lot about how many rate hikes are priced in and what the federal reserve's target is for the year. And I think we're probably between three and a half to three seventy five right now for the year yep. is where the federal reserve itself is targeting in terms of being. Um, and yet you have a two year that you said is three Oh eight. Right which implies that we will actually have declines uh, in those interest rates beginning about this time next year, suggesting that inflation is expected to come down relatively quickly and or uh, we'll be dealing with a recession as well. And I, th I think that's, that is what the market's telling us right now. Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. Um, so the question is, and, and Tom kind of alluded to this earlier, is uh, as we transition to stocks is, is the bottom in or is this just a breather uh, where we had a nice little rally neck last week? Um, and I do think it depends on a few things. Tommy can add a few um, as well. But number one is going to be guidance warnings. We have earnings that are going to be reported in about three to four weeks time. Um, but historically, what tends to happen is that you have companies like we already saw from Target, like we already saw from Microsoft, come out and say, you know what, we're not going to be hitting the numbers this, this quarter. We're going to do these numbers instead. And that could take some of these stocks down uh, before they even report the official numbers. And that will be coming out over the next week or two to the extent that there are guidance warnings. Number two is we want progress on actual inflation, not just inflation expectations. Obviously last week was a big week for taking down inflation expectations. We need to actually take down inflation. We need continued lower oil and gas prices. And we do need indications that the war could come to an end in Ukraine. I think we are beginning to see some of the softening of sanctions in terms of the Germans right now saying that the sanctions are having an impact on Russia because they are preventing its access to state-of-the-art technology. That's a different tactic that they were taking before. Before they were saying, no technology, no uh, oil and gas. Now they're shifting, uh, seem like they're shifting the goalposts just a little bit. Um, so those are what I think it's dependent on. My view is that it's a breather. Uh, companies are seeing a lower sale level of sales generally. Balance sheets are beginning to deteriorate. Um, I probably call this a bit of the eye of a storm. Uh, there was a great article on CNBC.com this morning that, that noted layoffs and not just layoffs in retail, not just layoffs in technology, but layoffs in investment banks. Um, right now, 
from the investment bank standpoint, they interviewed a recruiter from DMC Partners, David McCormack. He said that he can't see a situation without reductions in the labor force in the second half of 2022. Uh, according to sources close to JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley, the work from home people would get the, would be the first to be let go. And this would probably take place in October and November. For a perspective on why the banks were doing this after they just paid huge bonuses, gave people tons of uh, big raises, IPOs are down 91% on a year-over-year -year basis. High yield bond issuance is down 75%. And deal volume, mergers and acquisition activity is down 30%. So we're seeing in mortgage originations, you're seeing in all these economies and ecosystems that are built around um, deals and, and built around credit. And this is where you're seeing a lot of the uh, layoffs begin to happen. Is it a venture, uh, a startup that relies on venture capital funding that's now not having a bunch of access to capital? That's one place. Is it uh, an investment bank that's no longer doing as many deals? That's another place. Or is it a uh, technology company that is reliant on people buying random stuff on the internet? And that's where we're seeing the layoffs. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's the end of the low rate era, right? I mean, it, a lot of people talk about, and we've talked about a ton that, you know, low rates lends itself to zombie companies that continue to uh, kick the can down the road, issue debt at lower and lower levels and hope, hope to hang on. Well, that ends, but the economic activity around that ends too. You know, investment banks make a lot of money keeping JCPenney or Radio Shack or Toys R Us alive. Uh, and that money is dried up substantially because those companies can't issue new debt. If they issued tons of debt to stay alive in 2020 when rates were basically zero, you know, now we're significantly above zero. You know, you don't want to replace bonds paying 8% with bonds paying 11%. And so now they've just got to hold on and survive. Uh, and that, that free money is not coming. But the, the unintended consequence there is that the investment banks aren't making money off them anymore either. Uh, and that trickles through, you know, throughout the whole economy. I mean, there is a business of keeping businesses alive uh, and that business is drying up. And then you have the investment bankers who aren't buying expensive apartments in New York. They're not buying expensive cars. They're not going on trips. Um, you have mortgage orig originators who aren't being able to originate mortgages because the refi, refi boom is done. And by the way, home, homes aren't selling nearly as fast as they were. You have all these economies and then everything that they purchase. So this is where the knock-on effects happen and we're not there yet. And so when I talk about it being a little bit of the eye of the storm, can, could there be a stick save? The stick save is interest rates normalize a little bit, markets stabilize, you have deal volume continue, you have uh, market stabilize and, and basically keep these guys with a job. But if we keep going the way that we're going, I think I am concerned that you're in the eye of the storm. You start to see layoffs in the second half of the year, and that's where things could really uh, accelerate to the downside. Yeah, I would agree with you. With the, the six eight would be that inflation comes down naturally in concert with interest rates going up. But that's not what we're seeing. And I don't think that there's much sign that that's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. So looking ahead for the week, uh, we do have Nike earnings reporting tonight. Not, this is going to be a very interesting quarter. The quarter just finished in May. So they took the lion's share of the lockdowns in China. So uh, I don't think that expectations are very high for the company at all. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Uh, and then it's a relatively quiet week. However, we are approaching quarter end. So there's always some weirdness uh, as, as we get closer to that. Uh, you have Constellation Brands, uh, the maker of Corona, Pacifico, and Modelo. They're reporting Thursday morning. Micron, uh, Bellwether, the semiconductor industry reports Thursday night. Uh, the quarter obviously ends on Thursday as well. Um, and then Friday morning, this is after the call, it's at 10 a.m., we will have the ISM manufacturing report, which is going to be one of the biggest final ingredients in that GDP report, which will kind of lock in, do we grow in Q2 or do we uh, retrench and officially enter a recession uh, in Q2. Uh, Tom, anything you're watching, uh, especially in municipal bonds, are they going to keep closing the gap a little bit? Yeah, just really looking at spreads right now. I mean, it's been advantageous for accounts. We're starting to see a little bit of, uh, of traction on pricing in portfolios on bonds, but, you know, it's a little bit of a head fake, I think. And, you know, the pricing obviously is irrelevant. We have individual bonds are all going to come back at par eventually, but I think the volatility is not finished. And so, 
uh, try to take advantage of the upside for clients who need to be rebalanced is really the big move this week. I'll be making a lot of trades to make sure we're in line. All right. Sounds great. Uh, again, Hicks is at the controls. Jonathan Hicks is at the controls for today and for the rest of the week. So if you have song requests before the call starts at 830 every morning, please get them into us. Um, and uh, happy to share his email, and you can bombard him with song requests as well. Uh, that's all for now. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow at 8.30.